The following program is for informational and educational purposes only and is not to be considered legal advice. Fraudsters Radio was created to expose the many scams and frauds that have so infected society today. Scammers, fraudsters, and rip-off artists abound, whether it's scamming homeowners with bogus foreclosure relief services, dating fraud, incompetent lawyers, or consumer rip-offs. It's high time the public has a voice. If you work in a profession that deals with fraud, or if you believe you were or are a victim of fraud, you now have a radio listening public that wants to hear from you. Please feel free to message us through our Fraudsters Radio Facebook page, and we may have you on the show as a guest. If you'd like to call in for today's show, the number is 646-668-8512. And welcome to Fraudsters Radio. I'm Lori Z, nationally syndicated radio host and consumer advocate along with my guest, Storm Bradford, who is the owner of Mortgage Fraud Examiners and a litigation consultant. Uh, Storm, are you with me today? I am. I'm not your guest. Well, you're my co-host. <laughs> yeah, you said I'm your guest. <laughs> yeah, well, it's been one of those days. Got a lot going on today. How about you? I'm good. Um, how was your weekend? Good? Uh, it was interesting. I'm actually going to share with you a fraud story shortly before we have our guest on at 115. But I thought you might want to talk first about some of the posts you've been putting up on your Facebook page about people who are getting in trouble with the foreclosure scams. Well, uh, you know, it's a normal everyday occurrence. You, you have all these scam artists out there that um, are there to make money off the um, – the backs of these poor homeowners that um, um, you know that are in foreclosure, and there's all these different schemes and scams, and you know, regrettably, uh, you know, homeowners they uh, they fall for it. Uh, you, you know, I've said it time and time again. It's a known legal fact. Legal fact. No, it's a known medical fact that when somebody's under stress, their logic centers or their brain shut down, and they will buy in just to about anything that's told to them. You know, the ridiculous arguments like everybody has $100 million in a treasury account and the social security number is your account number and you can withdraw the funds out to pay your mortgage. I mean, all kinds of nonsense like that. But uh, basically, it's the same old, same old. It just goes on every day. It's just more and more of these scam artists and, uh, you know, taking yeah. advantage of the homeowners. Well, I, I wanted to share a little story with you about PayPal and how I almost, almost, got scammed on Friday. And so what had happened was I had a, um, I have a PayPal, a newer PayPal account, and th- I had a, a problem, a question about a transaction. And so from my phone, I Googled for PayPal, you know, and they have a lot of numbers, toll-free numbers. And so one of the numbers came up, you know, and I clicked on it on my phone. And it was, it was kind of early in the morning, so I'm not quite there, and I don't drink coffee, so I'm not at my hyper mode yet, you know. <clears throat> And so the guy answered the phone, and I explained that I had a problem with the transaction. And he asked me what the email was to the account, which is fine because I have more than one. And uh, then, then he asked me for my password. And I thought, well, that's weird because PayPal doesn't ask for your password. But meantime, he tells me he can see into my account, and he reads me the name of the person that made a deposit and the dollar amount. And I had never given him the, the password, only my email. And so something, you know, the hairs on my neck are kind of like standing up going, something's not quite right. And so at the same time, I go on back to my desktop and I see an email from the real PayPal saying, did you just change your password? Uh, you know, if so, if, if so, uh, no problem. But if not, call us right away and change your password now. So I got off the phone with the guy because I started to realize it mm, doesn't sound like it's really PayPal. I changed my PayPal passwords on my account. Uh, then, uh, and the guy kept trying to call me back, I, and he, when I spoke to him, he said, oh, your, your account, there are three other people on your account, one from Nigeria, one from South Africa, and one from Dubai. So, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, this is sounding kind of scammy here. Something doesn't sound right. So when I got the email, I did change everything, like I said, and I called my banks just to verify that everything was okay, uh, you know, changed some passwords on that. Um, <laughs> the ironic part of it was, PayPal was so busy that day that it was two hours to get a call back in their automated system. So when I got the call back, I then uh, explained to the guy I needed to speak to someone in the fraud department because, of course, I had the phone numbers and wanted to report them. 
And he transferred me, and I waited 45 minutes, and they disconnected me. And so finally wow. I got onto their, their Facebook page um, where they have like a bot that auto-responds when you do chat. And then finally I got a real person, but she didn't understand what was going on. Finally I got a supervisor, uh, and we went back and forth for a while, and I said, look, you should have an emergency number because I thought all my money was going to get sucked out of my bank accounts when this guy said he could see into my account and read me the transaction. And, uh, you know, he apologized, but I'll tell you, it, it, it kind of freaked me out because now – I'm thinking, who? how can they possibly get into my account without a password and be able to see transactions? So, of course, yes, I did change all of my passwords. Uh, but I know so many people who do get hit, and I'm not sure what the law is with PayPal. Like, if you lose your money, you know, uh, to fraud in an FDIC-insured bank, you know, they give you the money back, but it can take a while. But I'm not sure with PayPal, what do they do? You know, because I don't think they're monitored by uh, the United States laws. So then you would have to fight for any money that was in your account. But could you imagine if this guy had gotten into my account and, like, withdrawn money? Well, PayPal will, I know, uh, help you get your money back. Okay. So you have no fear there. They will help you get your money back, especially if you've been scammed. But, um, you know, it, it just goes to show, and this is why we created this radio program is to, you know, educate the public that there's these types of things that go on on a daily basis. I got something right. this morning from GoDaddy, allegedly GoDaddy, that okay. says that uh, we've shut down your website. And it uh -oh. says GoDaddy, and, and, and I think they're out of Arizona. It has everything from GoDaddy, and it says that you need to do so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so in order to get your website back up. So I looked at the email, and it wasn't an email that came from GoDaddy. It was some mm -hmm. other reason you know, um, email address from like overseas. So right. I, I'm telling you, I looked at it and I said, oh my God. I said, I get it. What, the, what are they talking about here? But then I looked at yeah. that, that where it came from and then it hit me. I said, it's just another scam. Right. It's, it's usually in the URL. And, pay, and the same thing with PayPal. I've gotten fake PayPal's because they're not coming from PayPal.com. They're coming from something, something slash, something slash PayPal. You know, it, it's not a regular PayPal address. In my case, though, these guys were really slick, and they tried to call me back. And when I looked up the numbers on Google, they, you know, through some of these uh, rating sites, they were marked as unsafe. So I don't know how they got their number marked under what looked like an official PayPal account. And PayPal, if you pull them up, usually has like, you know, two, ad two that look like ads and then one that looks like normal. But the number was posted under one of the legitimate ones, and so, you know, that's why I, I called. But I'm going, something's wrong. They usually answer with an automated system and press one and do that. And this was where it went right to an actual person. But the kicker storm was when the guy said, well, I'm going to, you know, don't change your password. I'm going to call you right back. And he, he goes, let me give you my direct number. And I hear someone in the background giving him an 833 area code number, which is probably out of the country. I don't even know. But when I heard that, I'm going, okay, these guys are definitely not PayPal, and I better get off the line and, and you know, call this number. But because I couldn't get through, I just went and change your passwords immediately if that does happen, and then alert your banks, I think, is the best advice for that. Well, you know, I've been getting a lot of phone calls from uh, some group uh, from New York. They're all New York phone numbers, and yes. they've called at least 100 times. And I told him, I said, look, lose my number. I'm not interested in your crap. Just lose my number. And, they'd, and then I would block that number. Then, like, later in the day, I'd see a New York <laughs> phone call again. Same people. Right. And yeah. I'd block that, and I'd tell them, lose my number. Don't call me again. And I'd block it. And I've been doing it, doing it, doing it. And then I got another phone call, and then I called him back. And I get this poor guy on the phone. And I'm reaming him out, and I said, look, I told you a hundred times, don't call this number. I'm going to report you uh, to the authorities. And this guy's like, what are you talking about? And it turns out they're just using randomly people's phone numbers. Oh, and yeah, I don't know yeah. how to do it. They have I don't they know have how machines. This, yeah, I don't know how it's legal. I had no idea. And he called up his phone company, and he goes, oh, yeah, we're having a big problem with this. Yeah. And it's really common because the, the, the bad people have some access to equipment that spoofs the phone number. So when someone calls the phone I'm on and it's the same first six digits of my phone number, 
I know that 99% it's, it's a spam call or a robocaller because they try to make it look usually like it's someone that's local to you. You know, so I don't pick them up. But I've had situations where uh, somebody called me up and said, why do you keep calling me? And I said, what do you mean? I haven't been on, on, you know, it was on my other phone. I haven't been on that phone all day. And he goes, well, someone's calling from your number. You know, it's one of those robocall things. I go, well, they're, just, they're spoofing the number. And I've also had it where I've called numbers that consistently spoof me, and it's a real person. So, yeah, I, you know, I'd love to have somebody maybe from the Federal Trade Commission, if we could get someone, to explain why is the do not call do not call that gov was not working, and why can these people get equipment that spoofs the number that makes it look like it's it's someone local or someone you know? And so, unfortunately, you know, I'm sure you're finding this problem too. Uh, unless I know, unless your number is already pre-programmed into my phone, 99% of the time I just let it go to voicemail because I know that it's probably one of these fake calls. You know, and, and I get them all the time, and it's very annoying. Well, I'm sure most people out there are annoying. With us, with us, you know, we, uh, you know, with us, we have clients, so you don't know oh, whether yeah. it's a client or not, and you know, you're trying to get back with them. But what's worse is, is like what happened to you that, and what I did to this poor guy that I was reaming out. You know, somebody's calling you. I'm saying, what the hell are you calling us for? And you have no idea what they're talking about. Right. Right. Yeah, we should try yep. to find somebody to get that on the show because I'd like to understand how that works myself. Yeah, I'll have to call the phone company and, and see because I, I don't understand how that works. And I don't know if they, maybe they're doing it from foreign countries or are they doing it in the United States. But again, you know, if, if, even if you have clients, like I, pro, like I program people, and you probably have a lot of people to program in your, in your phone, but I get to the point where I, I almost dread answering the phone. You know, because I don't know who it's going to be. And then, you know, on your phone, they have apps like RoboKiller or other apps. Some of them are free. Some of them are no charge. And they rate, <coughs> excuse me, how risky the call is. But even if you have something like I do called Blacklist, which is a free app, every time you get a call, you've got to put it into Blacklist. Well, over the past year, I must have hundreds of numbers storm in my Blacklist. And all they do is just change the number again and again and over and over, and it keeps repeating. And, you know, by the end of the day, you're crazy. But after, uh, after a month of it, you're going, I don't want to answer the phone anymore. And, and the same situation here. You know, a lot of times I really feel like I need to answer the phone, but I'm so tentative now in answering the phone. Well, you know, it's funny, too. I, you know, I'm an admitted computer and Internet illiterate. I admit it. <laughs> I don't know how stuff works. I don't care how it works. But the other day, I got a phone call from a friend of mine who I know lives in Florida. And um, I get this phone call from California. And it's my friend from Florida. And I said, what are you doing in California? He goes, I'm not in California. I said, wait a minute. I just saw on my phone that this call's from California. Oh, well, I, this is a Google number. Yeah. And I said, what are you talking about? He goes, well, didn't you know that you can get a phone number from Google for free? I said, no. Mm -hmm. He goes, well, this is what it is. So, you yeah. know, again, this is, it, it, it's almost like these Google and different companies and things like that are almost promoting the ability for scammers to scam the public. Yeah. But in a way, I understand that I have friends that have Google numbers, you know, and, and someone like me who's been a victim of identity theft, sometimes I think it would be smarter to have a Google number so that people wouldn't have the direct number but I don't know if that really cuts down on any of the robocalls. Um, you know, you might be able to buy equipment that senses. Uh, I saw something recently. There's some type of equipment that senses when it's a robocall and, and will block it. And, and some of these apps will just kick the robocalls into your voicemail so that you're not hearing it when it's on. You know, it, at the time, it, it's coming through as unsafe. So they just kick it to the voicemail. And then you have to go through the voicemail to, to listen through and make sure that it really, you know, was a scam call. But when I read up on it, it it's amazing. It's just totally amazing. Well, you know, uh, I, I don't know what to say, uh, you know, regarding these, uh, uh, you know, companies that, you know, that allow people to use these numbers. And, again, I, I agree with you. There's got to be some sort of technology that you could use that would identify something as being a robocall. But, I mean, that seems – me using common sense, that would almost be an impossibility. Because how do you yeah. know? You know, no. I mean, how do you know? Just like this poor guy I'm ringing out the other day for calling me all the time, and he, you know, it's not me. So he, yeah. he says I'm going to call my phone company, and he says, Oh, yeah, it's a big problem we're having. Yeah, 
Yeah, I think I'll try and do that. Now, we're going to go to a commercial break. So when we come back, I want to do an intro for, for our guest. I'll tell you a little bit about him. And I think it's going to be a really interesting show. So stay with us. By the way, right before back. we go to a break, I was going yeah. to tell you that um, uh, ABC 8 News in Richmond, Virginia, um, did a, fo- did a follow up on our radio show. It's uh, how home buyers and sellers beware cyber criminals are targeting closing funds. Oh, cool. And, and remember, we did the show on that uh, uh, a few yeah. months back with, uh, with uh, the guy from Florida who would explain that uh, it was. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, it was millions of dollars. And this is what this is about. I'm going to go, I'll, I'll send it to you so you'll have it. But. Uh, it's yeah. quite interesting. It basically just repeated what we were uh, broadcasting Bang. on our show before. Exactly. Well, we want people to be smarter. So, so let's do that commercial. We'll come back. I'll, I'll do an intro for the guest, and he has an interesting story. I think you're you're going to enjoy listening to him. So, uh, stay with us. <laughs> Have you received a notice of foreclosure on your property? Do you suspect that you're involved in an unfair or fraudulent loan agreement? Are you looking for a way to save your home? Would you like to cut through all the misinformation and find out what really works? Would you like to learn strategies that the so-called gurus aren't aware of? If you answered yes to any of those questions, a professional team at Mortgage Fraud Examiners can assist you and your attorney with all of these things and more. Contract breaches, errors, statutory regulatory violations, fraudulent appraisals, and other fraudulent conduct cause most mortgages to be legally problematic. In fact, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation found that nearly 2,000 financial institutions they assess receive citations for significant compliance violations. They also examined appraisals and found out that of the 259 appraisals reviewed for accuracy, Only seven fully complied with professional standards. Call us at 844-920-7200. That's 844-920-7200. Mortgage Fraud Examiners, 844-920-7200. Okay, we're back on Fraudsters Radio on AM FM 24-7. The call-in number is 646-668-8512. We have a special guest today, Edward Epperson, and uh, why don't you uh, introduce our guest, uh, Laurie, and have him explain a little bit sure. about what he does. I will. And, and his name is actually Edwin D. Epperson III, and he's the president of VFM Corporation. Now, Edwin, are you on the line? Uh, yes, ma'am. How are you doing, Laurie? I'm doing good. Um, Edwin, I have Storm Bracker as my co-host. He is a litigation consultant. He owns mortgage fraud examiners and note examiners. And so uh, before we go, I'm going to ask you a few questions, but I, I looked on your LinkedIn profile, and it's pretty impressive, and I want to thank you for your service because you're actually, you actually earned a Green Beret, and you were some type of uh, combat scuba, scuba diver. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, Storm, very nice to be on the call with you guys both. Uh, thank you for having me on the show. Uh, yes, I, that is a past service. life. Absolutely. No, it was it was fun while I was in. I really enjoyed my time. I was part of the Seventh Special Forces Group. Uh, I was a Green Beret, uh, specifically on a combat dive team. So a lot of our training mimics the SEALs. I would say we are probably the best kept secret in the Army because people just don't do not assume that the Army has a waterborne uh, special operations, and, and so we are one in few of the same. We actually have, uh, of the combat dive units, there are fewer combat divers than there are uh, Navy SEALs. So it, it's a unique uh, skill set within the Green Beret community, and I really enjoyed my time while I was in. Well, you wow. learn something every day. I've got a brother-in-law who was a SEAL, and, uh, you know, he'd tell me about uh, all the training that they had and so forth and so on, the rigorous training that they had. And I had no idea that uh, the Army had the same thing. That's, uh, that, how, does, how does one compete the Army with uh, uh, the Navy and their uh, dive teams? How do they compete that way? 
Well, I wouldn't say it's necessarily uh, competition. It's it's almost like comparing apples and watermelons. Uh, The entire metal task, which is your mission essential task list, your metal tasking for Green Berets are completely different than for SEALs. Uh, The Green Beret mission set, if you will, is is really focused on uh, unconventional warfare, UW, whereas SEAL teams are very focused on direct action. So the SEALs have a target. They go in, kick the door, shoot the bad guys in the face, uh, rescue a hostage, or, you know, pull, uh, get proof of the bad guy, and then they're out, sort of like what we saw with the uh, raid on the Osama bin Laden uh, compound. Whereas with Green Berets, we go in and we embed with the local indigenous populace. We live among them. We train them up, and we are what you would call a force multiplier. You saw the the quintessential UW campaign that was run during Vietnam, and I know that Vietnam has, and the Vietnam veterans, bless their heart, they have a lot of, uh, you know, they came back to a country that did not support them at all and what they did. But what the Green Beret community was doing over in Vietnam was just, it was exactly what we were trained to do, and that is to go into the indigenous indigenous force and then raise up an army from within the local populace, uh, basically almost be a, um, you know, a coup on that government and and replace the existing powers with uh, forces that would, you know, hold to that, hold to the democratic viewpoint of, freedom of the uh, freedom of press freedom basically all of our constitutional rights implementing people in power in that foreign country that would uphold those type of view to the human rights that their citizens should have so yeah the, the, it's very different very very different in our different mission sets but you know it's amazing Ed, is that i guarantee you 99.99999 percent of the country has no idea that you guys exist in that capacity well, uh, it's uh, like I said, it is the best kept secret of the army. So <laughs> <laughs> well, you've done a hell of a job keeping it secret. Yeah, it sounds I'm like sorry, a book to me. It, Storm. Yeah, well, I'm here. Yeah, he asked you to repeat. Oh. Hey, what was that? He asked you to repeat. Uh, I was last just asking for you to repeat. Uh, I don't know if it was just a side comment. I, forgive me, both Lori and Storm. I, my connections got a little bit of a delay, so I'm trying to not overstep. Uh, as you all speak and as I speak, so. Um, oh no, you're. Go, go yeah, that's ahead, fine. Look. That's fine. So I know, and we're going to go into your story in just a moment. But I want to bring up also, we know each other because you are also a, a radio host. You're a podcast host uh, for our, our investors saving the world. So you do have, or can investors save the world? And that's your show, and that's how we know each other. But I want you to tell, uh, you know, to kind of tell the story of who you are. Uh, about your company and about the situation that you had contacted me about. Okay, absolutely. I'll be more than happy to do that. And Storm, this will fit right into the world that that you operate in, but probably on the other side of the table. So in the latter years of my military career, I got into real estate investing. Uh, However, I did not start investing in real estate the traditional way, like the 99% of Americans who think of real estate investing get into. And the typical way to approach real estate investing is you're going to go out, you're going to get a loan, and you're going to buy a property. Uh, You rent it out for cash flow, or you fix it, sell it for profit. Uh, I got on the other side of the table being the one that loans the money. I had some friends and buddies of mine in the military, uh, and we put our money together, and we started to loan our money uh, secured by first position on these properties to real estate investors. And so the, uh, the length of time that our capital was deployed was not 30 years. It was typically six months to a year. So we had a high velocity of our capital, which uh, inevitably high velocity equates to a higher yield on your capital on an annual basis. And on top of that, we were secured. Our capital was actually secured to that real property by virtue of a mortgage or a deed of trust, depending on the state that we operated in. Now, Uh, All of this, of course, fell into the regulations for private lending within each of the states that we wanted to invest in. And if uh, we needed a license within that state, then we would simply connect and and work through licensed individuals for that state, whether that was an attorney or whether that was a licensed mortgage broker. Um, And so the last few years that I was in, I really focused on building out this business. I fell in love with it to the point that in 2014, my last uh, trip to Afghanistan, where I actually made my very first loan 
on the side of a mountain uh, in Afghanistan. <laughs> uh, when I got mm-hmm. back from that trip, uh, my wife and I decided to go ahead and pursue a less uh, life-threatening uh, job. <laughs> so <laughs> I told her, I said, well, this is an opportunity I feel I can do very well in, so uh, let, let's pursue this. And so she was on board, and in 2015, I exited the military and started to do this full time. Right about that time, uh, at this point, I had completed, uh, you know, about 27 loans. I had originated, I had underwritten those loans, and I had uh, pulled, I had put my investors' capital and my capital into these loans. So we had some performing loans, and I had yet have a loan go bad. So it was almost that deceptive thought process that can creep into anybody's mind when things are going well that, well, everything I touch is gold, uh, nothing's ever going to happen, uh, I can just, I, I can start, honestly, you start to get that cut the corners mentality. I can do this, I don't need to do that, you know, we'll, we'll take someone's word for it. And in April of 2014, I found, I found myself in a very tight predicament. And that's, that's what I contacted you about, Lori. I love the premise of the show. I think there's a lot of people that get scammed. Uh, and I know that, Storm, your business is focused on those uh, that are loaning money to homeowners. Uh, and I, I wanted to present a potentially different aspect, a different angle to that, because sometimes it's not always – uh, most of the time it is the homeowners, but sometimes it's the people that are making the loans, and especially in the investment world, uh, there can be fraudulent act, uh, actors out there trying to scam investors out of their capital. And that's, that's what I wanted to come on the show today and, and discuss with you both. Well, let me tell you, you know, tr- uh, trust me when I tell you this, I'm on your side. Um, you know, what we do for a living at Mortgage Fraud Examiners is analyze mortgage transactions. Um, and to see if there's any wrongdoing on part of any player in the program. It doesn't necessarily mean that it was the lender who created the problem. It could be the appraiser. Uh-huh. could be the title company. could be dependent upon the factual scenario of the case, the person who sold you the house, the uh, real estate agent, the mortgage broker, um, you know, the, the uh, appraisers, the title company, whatever. But I tell every, every homeowner that reaches us, uh, I, I said, look, you need to understand something. You have a contract with the lender, and the contract is very clear. You promised the lender that you would make timely payments, pay your taxes, and pay your insurance, and if you didn't, they could take the house, period. End of conversation. Yeah. So the, what we do is is we look to see if there's problem areas, but – as I tell everyone, I said, look, don't tell me that the lender defrauded you. How could, if you went to a lender and said, will you loan me $400,000, and they gave you $400,000, how could they possibly have defrauded you? You're listening to a bunch of these scammers that are out there that are trying to sell you all this nonsense to blame everything on the lenders which is not the case because in most, of, most cases that we see, uh, or every case that we see, obviously the homeowner breached the contract. And that's why the lender's yeah. taking the property because they weren't making the payments. We're just looking to see if there was appraisal fraud, broker fraud, title company fraud, any violations of uh, statutory or regulatory mandates, or any other uh, problem areas where maybe the contract got breached or the legal descriptions were bad, or some things like that. But no, uh, uh, you know, trust me when I tell you that uh, I understand the business that you're in, and I understand it's a tough business, and the majority, the vast majority of the time, it's no wrongdoing by the lender. It's usually wrongdoing by some other party, and if not the homeowner themselves. Right, so. and before we continue on, guys, before we, before we continue on, we've got to go to a short commercial break. And Storm, you can start. You can start again when we come back. So stay with us. There is a very high likelihood your mortgage contains an extensive error. At Mortgage Fraud Examiners, we know just how costly a missed opportunity can be. For almost 40 years, we have consulted, retained, and referred to by attorneys, lawyers, trial practitioners throughout the nation. Put another way, we are the trusted source for litigation support. A foreclosure is basically an allegation the homeowner breached the contract by failing to make timely payments. The contract is clear. The borrower promised they would make timely payments, and if they didn't, the lender could take the property. 
The only way to overcome the homeowner's breach is to show the lender breached first. Identify errors that would void the contract. Identify regulatory violations. Identify appraisal fraud and other fraudulent contact. And the only way to find these wrongs is to thoroughly examine the whole mortgage transaction. This meticulous examination of your mortgage transaction and appraisal can identify legal defects that would make your mortgage unenforceable and entitle you to compensation or even free title to your property. Call us at 844-920-7200. Mortgage Fraud Examiners, that's 844-920-7200. 844-920-7200. Okay, we're back on Fraudster's Radio Show at 24 AM FM 24-7 Radio. The call in number is 646-668-8512. And our special guest, Ed Epperson, was... Uh, Basically, tell us a little bit as, about his background and, uh, and what he does. And, uh, Ed, keep going. Yes, sir, I'm here. Anything yeah, else uh, uh, that you like to explain to us? Well, I mean, uh, we, we could jump right into my specific scenario of, of how myself and some investors uh, were defrauded of capital. But I don't know if there's any other questions that you have that you want to ask to set the stage or if you want to go ahead and dive right into that scenario. Yeah, I was just going to say, dive right in and tell us what happened. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, as I said right before the break, uh, in April of, uh, let's see, this was April of 15. Um, so uh, I had, this was very, you know, this is wrapping up my time in the military. At this point, I had, you know, at the end of 15, I had done about 27 loans. Uh, before, during this time, I had made this loan. Uh, I wasn't aware that it was going to be as bad as it was. So the scenario is uh, I had a broker, a licensed broker here in the state of Florida, reach out to me, and he said, uh, Mr. Epperson, you know, we've got a gentleman requesting a bridge loan for a very short time. It's going to be about two weeks, and he needed the capital to be put in escrow. Uh, once the money was in escrow, there was going to be a bank uh, that looked at that escrow deposit and said, okay, uh, the borrower has the funding, and the bank was basically going to – finance the entire purchase of this large uh, commercial property up in Minnesota. And with that uh, entire purchase, our money was going to be returned back to us. So it, it's, a common, it's a common transaction where you're looking at large purchases and a bank needs more time to do their underwriting due diligence. And the seller is adamant to get the property sold. The purchaser, the buyer needs to buy that little bit of time, and so they need a bridge loan. Typically, you know, it's a few weeks to as, as much as 180, 180 days, six months, but that's what they were requesting. And so the, my broker brought it to me. Um, the broker presented me uh, a bunch of documents that, quite frankly, didn't line up with the industry. And I would say that would probably be the first uh, and most uh, clearly seen lesson is that know what documents are common to the industry and, and, and know what the, those documents look like, as well as when you're dealing in the industry of investments and especially real estate, uh, there is a lot, there should be a lot of professionals, licensed professionals involved in that transaction. Uh, somewhere in the documentation, whether it's an appraisal, whether it's a BPO, whether it's an inspection, whether it's title and escrow, uh, you know, sometimes those are uh, two different uh, functions performed by two different parties. And sometimes in most cases, like here in the state of Florida, uh, the function of escrow is actually performed by the title company. Um, you're going to have a lot of licensed people at work in this loan. So if you have documents that you're looking at, especially if you're looking to loan your money out, secure to real estate, to a real estate investor, which I would highly recommend. I'm not a big fan of loaning private capital to individuals who are going to live in the property. There's a lot of walls that you have to fall underneath when you do that. If you stay on the commercial loan uh, side of the house where you're only loaning to a business from your entity, it is considered a business-to-business -business transaction. Quite frankly, that's, in my opinion, that's the best and, and highest profitable uh, side of the table to be on. But within this transaction, there were documents that were presented to me that uh, the, there were no contact uh, numbers to the title company, to uh, anybody, really. Uh, it was just a bunch of uh, Excel documents and Word documents that were put together. There was no proper letterhead uh, on any of the documents presented by the borrower. It just 
red flags started to go up. And I would say that would be the second lesson uh, if your listeners or anybody is looking at doing an investment or uh, they are getting contacted by, quote, unquote, these companies that are going to help them out of a bad situation. Uh, look for contact information. Look for uh, the documents to align with the industry standard. And if they don't know what those documents look like, then obviously reaching out to someone like you, Storm, or somebody else in that industry that should be able to point them in the right direction uh, would be very highly recommended. Um, well, I was going to make so a comment. And, coming, yeah, I was yeah, going to make go a ahead. comment uh, about uh, you had said, which is true, that if you lend on the commercial side, you're not worried about TILA violations or different type of uh, uh, mandatory um, regulations. Uh, section 32, some like of those other, yes, those laws. other consumer advocacy laws. That's correct. Yeah, because when you're when you're um, uh, loaning money to uh, Joe homeowner who's looking for a loan uh, on his piece of property to live in, you fall under those uh, statutory and regulatory mandates. Uh, now, let me ask you this. I mean, it, it, you're obviously a bright guy. Had you let this slip, slip by you? Did you get lazy or had, had this slip by you? Oh, excellent question. So, you know, I, I was doing this for investment purposes. So, you know, we were loaning money. This was uh, my investors, a gentleman that I had met, ladies that I had met, guys that I had worked with in the military. And this was a lot of the money was in a self-directed IRA or inside a solo 401k, which is a QR, a type of QRP or some type of investment account, right? So we were loaning our money out in these loans. And so obviously we're talking uh, long-term wealth. We're talking, you know, we, we're looking for a good return. That's basically what it boils down to. And I would say that that would be another big red flag is when the numbers look too good to be true, <laughs> they typically are. Uh, and so we started to get, you know, the borrower was willing to pay us. Uh, let, me, let me run you down uh, some real quick numbers it's just so that you can understand, like, as somebody that was new, honestly, I was only, I had only been doing this for about half a year uh, full time. Uh, so for somebody to get a borrower that was willing to pay these type of rates, it was phenomenal. I mean, our annualized return was well in the 30%. So they were going to pay for two weeks, two weeks worth of use. So our money was supposed to go in escrow. It was not supposed to leave escrow. So, I mean, it, it's as if it was in our checking account still. But to have the money sit in that escrow account, they were going to pay 10 points or 10% of the loan amount up front. Then in two weeks when the bank bought, provided the entire financing deal structure, uh, we were going to get paid 10 points on the exit. And then we were going to get paid for two weeks' worth of time. We were going to get paid two months of prepaid interest uh, based on a annualized uh, rate of 15%. So we would get basically uh, almost 3% on our money as well uh, based on two months' worth of prepaid interest. So we're looking at, I mean, phenomenal annualized, as an annualized basis, the returns on this were going to be incredible. The safety was supposed to be extremely mitigated. And the fact that the, the money was never going to leave escrow. It was going to sit in escrow. And so that's where, that's how I got deceived. That's how I and my investors got deceived is these numbers were just fantastic. And we started to ignore these red flags. We started to, well, you know, it's a really tight transaction. You know, the timeline's so crunched, you know, okay, the, the borrower's not able to produce all the documents we typically ask for. That's okay. Uh, we had actually reached out. We found the title company. Uh, this was supposed to be closed in Georgia. So we found the title company and the escrow company, which were two separate companies in the state of Georgia. In this transaction, there were two separate companies. The title attorney was telling us, there is no way that we can close this loan and have you in first position. The title uh, and the title on these properties. So uh, sorry for going backtrack. So the premise of the deal was this borrower was going to put up as collateral, meaning he was going to pledge to us, the lenders, six properties that were free and clear. The value of these six properties were supposedly right around 949000 So we had the addresses to these properties, and we were waiting on the title reports for these six properties. Then once 
we collateralized these six properties. That's what was going to be held in collateral until this closing on the big commercial property happened. Well, the attorney that was doing the title searches for these six properties that were supposed to be free and clear told us, hey, listen, these properties are filthy dirty. And, it, and, and the lingo in this industry means that there are liens. Uh, it could be anything from federal liens like tax liens to municipal or city liens like uh, water and electrical bills not being paid to mechanic liens, meaning there was work done on the property and the person who performed the work was never played, paid, so they placed the lien on the property for that payment. Either way, all these properties, all six properties, were very, very uh, dirty. They were leaned out the hill. And so the attorney was telling us there's no way we can close in two weeks. It's going to take months to clean up all these titles. And, and so I started engaging with the broker and the borrower. And the borrower, and this is lesson number three, as an investor, if you're going to loan money, you always, 100% of the time, you use your own licensed individuals. You use people in the industry that you have personally reached out to, you vetted, you have put through the questionnaires, uh, you know about their company. Uh, in this case, the borrower referred us to an attorney out of Virginia that he had worked with before. So uh, I and my broker, I asked my broker's opinion, and of course, the broker is getting paid a commission on this. So the broker, it is in the broker's best interest to make this deal go through, to make this deal happen. And so I asked the broker his opinion, and he said, yeah, let's just use this attorney out of Virginia. Uh, he'll make this happen. We'll get it all done. And so we reached out to that attorney, and the attorney provided what is called an opinion letter. Now, an opinion letter is not actually a title insurance. It does not do anything except for state as an attorney. I have reviewed the, the title uh, Paul, uh, the, the chain of title on each one of these properties, and in my opinion, these, these titles will be clean uh, when they close uh, in two weeks. That's what an attorney's letter of opinion is. And so I took it at face value, and uh, the broker obviously was encouraging me. And when we wired funds in, so everything, like the whole closing, the transaction that was supposed to be happening down in Georgia, because that's where these six properties were located in, in and around Atlanta, Georgia, the title company and the escrow company were both in Georgia. And so by the broker and my borrower's uh, recommendation, the attorney out of Virginia t took on the title and the escrow function of closing. And so we wired funds into escrow and then violating my escrow instructions, which are written documentation from the lender that tells the attorney this is exactly what needs to happen to the documents, the money, uh, recording, anything pertaining to closing. That's what's called in the industry escrow instructions. Violated my escrow instructions, dispersed the money directly to the borrower, and then the borrower mm. disappeared. <laughs> oh, so God. We are, well, that's a we nightmare. are actually, and I know that we're coming up on a, a, a break real quick, and when we come back, I can discuss exactly where we're at now and maybe some more lessons learned. But that's, that's sort of the scenario and where we're at. So we had a licensed professional that was actually involved in this scam. Well, let me tell you something, uh, Ed. I can tell right off the bat what happened. Um, th you were blinded, as a lot of people are, by the greed fog. Um, yes, sir. These, Absolutely. These were numbers that you guys looked at and said, wow, we can make a killing on this. Let's get it done. That's, that's yep. flag number one for a scam. And um, yep. it, happens, it happens to the best of us. It's that greed fog. You're blinded by it and you go for it. I can see a couple other mistakes too. Number one, um, you have an attorney in Virginia who's committing malpractice and violated yep. the uh, unauthorized practice of law because I don't care if you're a lawyer. If you're a lawyer in Virginia, you can't give legal opinions on something in Georgia. So yes, sir. You, you've actually got a case against that lawyer. By the way, what's yep. the lawyer? Oh, yes, name? we do. Uh, his name is Kenneth Free. Uh, he is an attorney uh, with uh, Knight, uh, Jason Knight. They had a firm that operated out of. Um, I can't remember the city. It's in Virginia. Uh, the, the firm has since closed down, 
and we've actually got a judgment against uh, Mr. Free, Kenneth Free, and we're we're pursuing him right now for his assets. Okay, well, guys, yeah, let's, let's go to yeah, Storm. Let's go to a quick break because we're on commercial time. We're going to come back, and then we can kind of finish up, and and maybe you can give him some more, more advice. So stay with us back in a moment. Consumers, do you have bad credit, can't purchase a house or car, paying too much in interest on your credit cards and loans, scammed by credit repair companies? There is hope. You can get back on track and do it the right way. Call Credit Education Consultants today at 813-500-6064. That's 813-500-6064. Or go to CreditEducationConsultants.com now and get the help you need. Don't delay. Call today. Mortgage reps and realtor inquiries are also welcomed. Okay, we're back on Fraudsters Radio, 24 a.m. FM, 24 AM, 7 a.m. Yep. And the call in number is 646-668-8512. Um, I was also going to comment, Ed, that um, uh, there is the bar associations, the Virginia bar associations and most bar associations around the country, they have fun that if you've been screwed by an attorney, you can hit that fund and maybe get your money back that way. Wow, I was not aware of that. Yeah, you might want to look into that. You might want to call the Virginia. Okay. Did you file? Did you file a complaint with the Virginia bar? Uh, so I've got an attorney uh, that out of Georgia because that's where the properties were located. So we went after. Uh, we there was a lot of this case that I briefed over uh, just to get the high level ten thousand foot view. But we've got an attorney in Georgia. They they had to once we got the um, the lawsuit against the parties that were in Georgia. Uh, we then went after the attorney in, in in Virginia, and so we had to domesticate our claim there in the state of Virginia. So we had to outsource, I guess, uh, find another attorney there in in Virginia, and we're going through them to domesticate that claim in the state of Virginia and then pursue. Uh, Mr. Free there in the state of Virginia. So I have not reached out to the bar there in Virginia. I, I've got my attorney uh, on that, and I can definitely run that by her to make sure that that's something yeah, that's run on that, our radar. Run that by her and file and file a complaint with the Virginia bar against this turkey. Okay. You, you want to make sure you get do that, that done? Absolutely. Have you, have you hired a Virginia attorney? Yes, we did. Uh, actually, I just had communication uh, from my attorney in uh, Georgia about the attorney there in Virginia. I haven't had a chance to to read it today, but yes, we have. We've retained yeah, another recommend- attorney there in Virginia. Yeah, I could recommend a uh, very good uh, uh, real estate attorney in uh, in Virginia that's very familiar with these types of things. Okay. So if you don't, uh, I will uh, definitely let's uh, let's connect after the show, and I would love any referrals that you have. That would be great, Storm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry to hear it. How much money did you end up losing in this deal? So this was a 1.6 million uh, investment. Um, uh, there was uh, 1.6 that includes all the attorney fees in, in invested in that as well. Um, so out of that, uh, we have uh, we have recouped by virtue of going after the other parties there in Georgia. We have recouped almost right around 1.2 just for round numbers sake. So we're still uh we're still sitting at about uh, 400 uh 400,000 that we 400 to 600,000 that we're still in the process of recouping from the sounds to me that so. sounds to me like that mortgage broker uh was working in concert with these other people to get this You know out. Yeah, you know what, Storm? I, I talked to my attorney and I inquired about her of whether we should pursue the broker as well. And and she said, you know, it's we could, um, but as far as the the onus, the onus relied, it was solely on my shoulders, which I accepted. So I, I've got three core values that I operate on. Uh, one of those is, is extreme ownership. Uh, I, there's a great book written by Jocko Wilnick and Leif Babin, two Navy SEALs, uh, great authors. They've written a book called uh, Extreme Ownership. And that, that thought epitomizes really what the special operations mentality is to approaching life, business, whatever it is. It's that I own it. It's my decision. No matter what happens, no matter what extenuating circumstances, it, it's, it's my responsibility. So... Um, it, it's, you know, that's something I have, I have owned it. It's my, it was my fault. Uh, I've talked very lengthily with the investors 
of the investors that were involved in this transaction, almost every single one of them have continued to invest with me in other projects. So it goes to speak uh, to that, that mentality of owning your mistakes uh, to what you did wrong in any scenario, and then obviously coming back around and saying, okay, what can I change? What can I fix so that this never happens again? And that's the beauty of this business is because it is so clean cut, it can be so clean cut. When you cut out emotion out of this industry, it's very, very black and white. And as long as you have good operating guidelines and principles, and more importantly, underwriting guidelines to operate by when you're making a loan, when you're investing into mortgages, uh, it, it's, it is a very clear cut and a very clean process. It's only when, like you said, Storm, and you pointed out, you know, when those emotions of greed uh, run high, and you start seeing the dollar signs, that's when danger creeps in. But, you know, Ed, it, it's kind of like homeowners that we talk to on a daily basis. Yeah, you're wrong. You breached the contract. You were totally wrong. However, that doesn't take away from the fact that there was appraisal fraud. You were fraudulently yeah. induced into the loan. But for that appraisal fraud, you wouldn't have gotten the loan in the first place, and you wouldn't have breached the contract in the second place. So... Yeah, yeah. We, we, you know, were you blinded by that greed fog? Yeah, you were. But by the same token, you had players on the other side that obviously knew what was going on. And let me tell you, uh, most cases that we see that there's problems with fraud and there's a mortgage broker involved, uh, like you said, uh, the broker, he doesn't care about you. He just wants to make a commission. And, uh, yeah. you know, I guarantee you, that along the way he knew what was going on. That's part of his job, too, is to, um, is to make sure that, uh, you know, because, again, you're a client, so was the other person who was uh, trying to get the money. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah, that's he, true. Knew, he knew or should have known what was going on, and he got you involved in something that uh, you, uh, you know, again, you, you, you let greed uh, blind you in some way, but by the same token, um, he knew or should have known that these people that uh, allegedly owned property that um, was encumbered, he should have known that. Yeah, yeah. And, and Storm, the, yeah. I want to ask a question. The, the guy, the lawyer who dispersed the funds, did he start another company, and had he been disciplined before? So interestingly enough, you asked that, Lori. So th when this whole thing started to unravel and unfold in the summer of, of 15, uh, you know, I, I started to really dig into what was going on because, again, this was supposed to only be two weeks. So the loan was made in the very last week of April. By the middle of May, we were supposed to have our funds back. Middle of May came and went. Now, the borrower maintained communication with us all through the month of May to the first two weeks of June, and then he just disappeared. Well, once that disappearance happened and we, had, uh, we couldn't get in touch with the attorney out of Virginia, I had no clue where our capital was. I started to do some research. And one of the things that I would encourage anybody uh, that's listening is that if you're dealing with licensed professionals, there is typically in every single state, you're going to have like the bar association. You're going to have a bar association in every state. If you're dealing with mortgage brokers or if you're dealing with appraisers or if you're dealing with some form of, of job that requires a license, you're going to have a body that oversees that license, uh, an ethics committee or something like that. And normally you can reach out to them and you can call them about this individual to find out if there's anything going on. Well, sure enough, uh, the third week of June, I, I, I just went online and I, again, I could have done this. It would have taken me about 10 minutes uh, back before we did the loan and I would have known this and I would have never dealt with this attorney. But I went on to the Florida bar, and sure enough, there was already a, uh, a file uh, of complaint against him mm -hmm. for, and go figure, for a case that involved the borrower about five to six years before us. You would be surprised, because and, 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 we're, you know, we're in the same area. Uh, if you go onto the Florida bar site, you will be surprised at how many attorneys have had disciplinary actions. Um, one of the things, we, I did invite the Florida Bar to actually be on our show to talk about their ACAT program, which is to help people who have been taken advantage of by, you know, allegedly by, uh -huh. by uh, attorneys, and they declined to do the show. But that should tell you something right there. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. But, you so, know, let me it, ask it, you. It, 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 
the title company has uh, uh, some um, exposure to this as well. Who the hell was the title company? So that's, uh, again, uh, the title company in Georgia, remember, we moved everything to this, this attorney uh, over in, in Virginia. He wrote what was called a title, uh, a letter of opinion. Now, again, this is early in my career. I, I didn't realize really what I should be requesting. Uh, a letter of opinion is worthless as the paper that it's written on. Uh, yeah. What really matters is, is the actual lender's title policy, which inevitably, when we closed on this loan, there was no lender. There was no uh, uh, title commitment letter. There was no closing protection letter. There was no uh, preliminary title, uh, title commitment, nothing. So in all reality, we did a loan without getting any title insurance on, on these six properties. So you had quite a learning experience now, and it never happened oh, again goodness. after that. Let me, let me ask no. you, who recommended, the, who recommended this Virginia attorney? Ah, again, uh, this goes back to why I'm very strong and adamant that if someone's going to invest, no matter what they're investing in, that any advice that they're taking, any opinions that they're taking are people that they personally know or that they personally have vetted. Uh, this Virginia attorney was given to me by the borrower. So the borrower recommended the attorney to my broker and to myself. The broker was, hey, this is a, he's an attorney. He can get us the letter of opinion. We'll clear up the title when we go to close. This will be good. I'm very new to the industry, uh, less than a year worth of experience, never had a deal go wrong. So I just thought that the broker was, hey, his, his word was gold. And so, uh, yeah, the uh, attorney was recommended to us by the borrower. By the way, the borrower's name is Christopher Hansen. Uh, you can look him up. He's spending time in federal prison right now uh, because when we were going through this transaction, he was actually indicted by the FBI out of uh, Minnesota, and the FBI was actually in the process of uh, going through their discovery and building their case. Uh, he was actually sentenced to prison time, five years, I believe, of, 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 white, of a white-collar crime of, of fraudulent uh, uh, and he involved two FBI agents in that scam that was prior to ours. But see, again, Ed, I mean, this is pretty clear to me that this mortgage broker who brought this guy to you knew or should have known this, who this guy was. Yeah, I, I, I yeah. agree. Uh, again, and it went back to the, the matter of the cost, right? Our focus at this point when everything started to unravel was, you know what, let's go after the parties that we're confident, like, that we can recoup some capital from. After doing a quick overview of this broker, my attorney said, you know what, it's going to be more of a drain on your capital and you, the likelihood of you recouping anything from that broker is going to be uh, pretty much n next to nil. And that's the difficulty, right, Storm, is, you know, we've got bad actors that need to be prosecuted, but I, I'm also, you know, looking out for my investors who are only wanting to get their principal back or as much of it as possible back. So that was the balance, right? Do we, do we file a, a civil complaint or do we, do we file a, a criminal complaint? Um, and so inevitably, we, we, the investors as a whole wanted to go after them simply for the money. They wanted to go after whoever could potentially pay. And so uh, right. that was the route that we took. Was this broker, yeah. licensed? Was this broker licensed in Georgia? I know, interestingly enough, uh, Georgia is a non-broker state as well as Florida is a non-broker state when you're dealing in the commercial loan uh, sphere. So if you're originating or if you're brokering out money on commercial loans, there's actually no licensing requirement in either states. Uh, in other states, there are like California, there's a requirement. In Florida and Georgia, there are no requirements to hold a license if you're brokering out a commercial purpose loan meaning business to business. Great. I'm going to, I'm going to connect you. Actually, uh, Ed, he is in the same group that you and I are in. We do have to close, but do you want to give out any contact information for our listeners before we go? Absolutely. If it, and I'm, I'm an open book, so if anybody wants to reach out and ask me more questions, by all means, uh, you can reach me at management at verticalfundmgmt.com. Uh, they can reach out to me or they can give uh, give me a call on my direct line at 813-906-2315. And, of course, LinkedIn is my main social media platform. You can find me on LinkedIn as well. Great. Ed, Thank you. Before, before we go, before we go, Ed, uh, yeah, let's get together because I'm going to be able to get you pointed in the right direction. And, 
actually give you something that's a much safer deal than lending money? Well, I, I actually like, uh, I, I really do like lending money. I, I enjoy it a lot. I enjoy <laughs> the, uh, but I'm open to anything, Storm. We can talk. We can well, if you talk. like lending Great. money, you'll like, you'll like this better, and your returns will be much better than what you're doing. Uh, All right, guys. Well, look forward to we're, running, we're, we're running over on time, so, yeah, I want to thank both of you for joining us. And thanks to our listeners for joining us today on Fraudsters Radio. You can join us again next Monday from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Time Live. Remember that we do want to hear your stories, and you can contact us through the Fraudsters Radio Facebook page. Thank you, gentlemen, uh, for a great show. Hopefully our listeners got a lot out of it. And and we'll sign off here. Thank you. Okay, guys. Enjoy your week. You too. Uh Bye.